Good evening and welcome to ESMT Berlin. My name is Jean-Marie Gebler. I'm Deputy Director of Corporate Communications here at ESMT Berlin. I look uh, forward a lot to today's discussion uh, under the title Lost in Transformation, Strategies for Sustainable Development. Joining us is Dr. Emma Scholz to my right. Uh, she's obviously co-president of the Heinrich Böhr Foundation here in Berlin. Uh, she also serves as the co-chair of the independent group of scientists, uh, which was commissioned by the UN for uh, the Global Sustainable Development uh, Report. And Dr. Scholz also sits on the Council on Bioeconomy and the supervisory board um, of Bread for the World. Joining her on stage is my beloved colleague, Olga Almquist, who um, is the senior manager of um, ESMT Societal Impact Financing uh, Initiative called Sci-Fi, as we say in short. Um, please allow me to tell you a little bit more about ESMT Berlin. Um, we're uh, Germany's number one business school and number eight in Europe. Uh, according to the Financial Times uh, Business School ranking um, of last year. Um, we have just celebrated our 20 year anniversary last year, which we were very happy about. We're growing further and um, we have just uh, under a thousand students right now and um, around three and a half thousand executives who join our um, executive education programs. Um, and this uh, open lecture series has been ongoing since 2009, I believe. Uh, it is a platform for discussion. Uh, we invite uh, speakers who are experts in their fields and who can give us their views. So without further ado, I will hand over the stage to you, Dr. Michelle, and the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I have to say uh, two things. One is that just to explain why uh, the co-president of a political foundation happens to be the co-chair of an independent scientific body. And that is because my previous uh, institutional identity was uh, the deputy director of the German Development Institute, which is today known as German Institute of Development and Sustainability. So um, I started as a scientist and while I was working in this group, I moved uh, to the Heinrich Böll Foundation. So, um, uh, I still have a researcher's heart and mind, I also think. Um, the other thing I have to say is that I, we have a lot of crisis meetings currently at the foundation uh, due to the, uh, the conflict, the war in, in uh, Israel and, and uh, Gaza. And that led to the problem that I forgot to put the PPT on the stick. And so now you will have it in German but uh, I will speak English, uh, but the slides are in German, but I have them in English, so I promise to send it afterwards. So those of you who would like to read them in uh, English can, of course, have um, the slides. It's the slide deck um, prepared by the team of UNDESA. All right, and uh, I just asked him to change the first page so that it doesn't appear <laughs> with the wrong, but yeah. So those of you who are fluent in German can uh, have an advantage. Okay, so thank you very much for this uh, invitation. Um, this, uh, you see here the, the first page of the report which we um, elaborated during the last uh, nearly four years. Times of crisis, times of change. That's um, in a nutshell what um, we think is, is the challenge. And, um, I think we can move on uh, to the next uh, slide. Uh, otherwise, I talk without the illustrations. Can you? Also, soll ich das machen? Entschuldigung. Ja, natürlich. Next. Sorry, I forgot. So, the yeah, okay. Yeah. So the uh, global sustainable development uh, has been mandated by the uh, General Assembly of the UN. So. Our addressees were the member states, and it was mandated in 2016, right after the uh, 2030 agenda was adopted, because member states felt that uh, beyond the um, annual progress reports edited by the general secretary on the basis of the data collected by the UN system, needed uh, some independent scientific advice to better understand if, why there was progress, and if not, why and what could be done about it. So it's a report which is written every four years. So always uh, in preparation for the SDG summit, 
which is every four years where heads of state attend. And um, it's important that it's an independent group of scientists. We were 15 uh, researchers from all continents, from different disciplines, from different backgrounds. And um, <clears throat> it's based, it's thought, uh, thought of being kind of an assessment of assessments, so based on UN, existing UN assessments, but creating an added value uh, to them. And also based obviously on the existing literature, but the idea is not to um, only as like we know it from the IPCC summarize the scientific uh, findings, but from that make uh, specific practical proposals for improving implementation. And the first one uh, in this kind was uh, um, published in 2019. And uh, the, it's, the, the group of scientists always changes. So we, our term finishes now at the end of the year and then the UN will um, make a call for nominating the next group of independent experts. So here you see uh, the members of the group. So um, the co my colleague, my co-chair was Jaime Miranda. He is a, uh, he heads the uh, um, School of Public uh, Health uh, at the uh, University of Sydney. He's Peruvian. Uh, and uh, then we had Ibrahima Hatch, who is an agricultural economist from Senegal, uh, Shirin Malekpur from uh, Monash University, Giovanni Madisi from um, uh, the African Institute of Development Policy in Malawi, uh, Pan Jahua, uh, from the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, who is a known member of IPCC for many years. Uh, we had Kasam, I never learned to pronounce her uh, family name from Qatar. Then uh, John Agard from Trinidad, who is a member of, has been a member of IPBES and also of IPCC. Asa Persson from the Stockholm School of Environment uh, um, Institute. Then we had Sergei Bobilev, from uh, Russia. We had um, Pauline Dube from Botswana. Then Ambush Sagar, of many of you should also know him from IIT in New Delhi, also an IPCC member. Jaime Montoya, from uh, a doctor from Philippines. Uh, Norishika Kanye from Keio University. And uh, Nancy Shackle from, uh, she's an oceanologist and she's both a scientist and a member of the public uh, administration dealing with um, the protection of, of oceans. So you see, we had a quite a diversity of persons and we started our work um, online, as we started in, in the middle of the COVID crisis. And then we were happy to have in total four physical meetings of which I missed uh, two because of COVID. <laughs> so our start was um, implementing the SDGs, where are we? I'm sure you are, uh, are all well aware that uh, we are far from, we are not on a, in a good uh, position of saying we will achieve them in 2030. Um, since 2019, um, progress has um, slowed down. Uh, and this, uh, especially in areas such as poverty, hunger, and uh, gender equality, maybe some of you heard um, the, under the Secretary General's report where he said, if we keep that pace, it will last, it will take 300 years to reach gender equality. And um, we see long-term negative trends in central areas such as climate protection, biodiversity loss, uh, inequality in all these the dimensions which are mentioned in uh, the 2030 agenda. And it is clear that if there is no turnaround, uh, further crisis will, will compound and make progress even slower. Um, there are some positive trends such as the awareness of SDGs is increasing. There are in many countries uh, specific committees or other institutions designed for uh, strategizing uh, on implementation, often in developing countries tied to the national development plans or as here in Germany tied to the national, the German strategy for sustainable development. Um, and there are also, um, uh, and in this context, there are also specific uh, uh, national goals derived from the 2030 agenda, but the overall picture is, is negative. And what we, um, it's clear that, no, I, I just return, it's clear that, of course, um, the COVID pandemic um, 
and uh, uh, um, the war in Ukraine, but also the many conflicts, ongoing conflicts and wars we have over the world have, are a big part of the answer why we are so slow in progress. But we are convinced that this is not uh, the central answer, actually, because if you remember the, the, the um, text of the 2030 agenda, especially the introductory uh, chapter, it speaks about transformative action. So it's very clear that the, um, the, the agenda has been criticized, that the wording of the goals have been criticized a lot by the scientific community, especially also in my old institute. Um, but um, because it's, it's, it's a political compromise. It's, it was a negotiation, so it's not scientifically designed. This has to be clear. But if you take the whole range of 17 SDGs together, then you see that what is aimed at is extremely ambitious and requires different approaches from incremental change as we are actually seeing usually in our um, uh, policies, in public policies. So um, that's why we thought we need to think about what transformative action actually means, what transformation, what distinguishes transformation from incremental uh, policy change based on, on uh, um, uh, the, the lowest common denominator. We then looked at the literature and what I want to highlight here is we looked at, there are um, a few uh, um, studies which uh, try to develop scenarios and to understand what type of interventions we would actually need for reaching the goals in 2030. And, what, and the scenarios then identified certain interventions for not for, uh, for, for uh, interventions, systemic interventions, which would aim at specific, at several specific goals at once, because that is the first starting point. The agenda is constructed uh, uh, on the basis of interlinkages between goals. So the basic under, um, uh, starting point of the agenda is that you should uh, um, use the overlaps between different policy fields, between different areas, um, goals to um, build on synergies so that you do not have a single strategies for each of one of the 17 goals, but focus on the overlaps, which are, uh, which can be seen if you look at the agenda by the, when you look at the targets. And so th that's what these scenarios build on. And the outcome was that if you have a middle of the road scenario where you have low ambition interventions, you don't reach the goals, not even in 2050, yeah? But when you go for ambitious synergetic interventions, then you have a chance of, of achieving quite some improvements by 2030. And um, so this, these type of interventions, which we also document in, in the report, uh, show, um, show the, the, the challenge which is inbuilt in, um, in, in the, the, the transformative action required by, by the agenda, um, because the interventions as such are, um, when you look at them, are very likely to, to um, uh, awake a lot of resistance because it implies um, that you have to, as I'm here at an at a, um, MBA school, so change your business models. Yeah, your current business models won't fit into that framework. And um, the first reaction is to resist that and say, why should I change it if it's working so nicely? But from the perspective, the comprehensive perspective of the 2030 agenda, it's not working perfectly, not even nicely. If you make profits, that's fine, but that is only a very limited part of the picture. Um, so that is uh, one thing which you see in, in, in our report. And um, so to illustrate um, our thinking, we built on the the central graph from the previous GSDR because our um, pragmatic approach was to say, let's not invent the understanding of what the 2030 agenda is and what kind of, of, of action it needs again at each report, but let's try to build on the previous report. And this is a matrix which um, uh, illustrates the 
interlinked nature of the agenda by saying, by identifying six entry points for transformation, which um, represent different ways of interlinkages between the goals. And these interlinkages are human well-being and capacities. It's, um, as I cannot read it from here, but <laughs> it's just and, and sustainable economies. It is uh, sustainable food systems and healthy nutrition. It's urban and peri-urban development. It's universal access to modern energy for all. I think in the last one is global environmental commons. And to, to reach, to really uh, devise transformative action, they, the report identified four levers for action. And the four levers are described in a very general way, governance, economy and, and finance, um, individual and collective action, and um, science and technology. It couldn't be more general than that, right? Um, but the point of the report was to say, you won't reach the goals if you limit your interventions to only one or two or three of these systemic entry points. And you won't reach them if you only focus on governance or if you only focus on economy and finance or only on individual and collective action. And individual and collective action is something which those who, who are interested in sustainable development often see themselves limited to voluntary, individual and collective action. And that does not lead us close to anything. And what, so what we decided is let's have a closer look at these levers. Let's have a better understanding what these levers actually mean for transformative action, what it means to actionate them all together in a concerted and strategic way. And then we realized we need a fifth lever. And that's the one we see below, the, the light blue one, and that's, we called it capacity building. That is a very traditional term. And when we first talked about it to Amina Mohammed, she said, the under secretary, deputy secretary general said, ah, we have done that for 30 years. It didn't help us at all. So we said, no, this is a type of capacity building, which, which is not a building on development cooperation. This is something which we need to do in all contexts because strategizing for transformation in six entry points at the same time is clear, has a much longer time frame. I mean, the 2030 agenda has a time frame which goes beyond one electoral cycle. Yeah, so you will need not four years, not eight years, but it was planned to have to think about 50, 15 years, right? So this requires the ability to build broad political support so that the strategy survive uh, a defeat in elections. It requires to have a joint and basic understanding of what transformation should reach and have a political uh, competition about what the best aims, the best means are, but not about the substantial point of it, right? So not debate again and again, is actually climate change important and should we invest in um, um, moving towards sustainable energies? Uh, if you discuss that every four years, then you won't reach, uh, make progress. So that's the, and then you need to build um, societal support, alliances which support this transformation. You need to have the ability of, uh, of anticipating conflict and resistance and devise uh, strategies and tools for dealing with that. And to, to do that, not only from the perspective of government but, and, and of a party which wants to be reelected, but also from the, include in that work societal actors such as the private sector, um, academia, uh, uh, trade unions, and so on. This will look different in each country, but that's why we said capacity building, having the, capacities in the sense of abilities and not only capacities in terms of um, human resources, for example, that is something which is uh, at the heart of understanding and managing and pushing forward a transformative process. Um, so, and that's the, the picture we designed. Um, I'm sure some of you will know innovation theory and the famous S-curve. So, 
um, is, it builds uh, and Ambush Sagar was part of the, of the team. So he's very much known for, for that um, area of, of research and knowledge. So what we, the, the why we, we liked this graph to illustrate our thinking and to illustrate to practitioners, policymakers, but also, yeah, uh, what's at stake in this transformation is that the point of departure, when you look at the green line, the green curve, yeah, is that there are innovations, technological ones, social ones, institutional ones, uh, that change also patterns of behavior and decision making. They exist or emerge. They need their diffusion needs to be accelerated. That's the second phase, acceleration by economic incentives, public policies, uh, learning by different means. To and then so that they go across a tipping point and they stabilize and sort of represent the new normal of doing things. But we have to be cl sure, clear that at the same time, this means that the, the old normal way of doing things, the old infrastructures, they need to disappear. Yeah, uh, I return to the example of, of uh, renewable energy systems. If we have renewable energy technologies parallel to fossil fuel based energy uh, sources, we don't achieve the necessary improvement in abolishing emissions, right? And it's, that's why these lines cross. And this crossing represents the resistance and the conflict which is embedded in transformation. And this is very important to, to understand uh, because it means once you devise a, um, a transformation strategy for one area, you have to think, okay, where is the resistance come from, coming from? And what are my possibilities of doing something against it? Not in the sense of repressing it, but in, in anticipating it and designing the, the transformation strategies and in tools and incentives and policies in a way that resistance is minimized and the communication and negotiation processes as well. There's much more to say about the graph, but I leave that to the questions. Now, this is about the, um, is, uh, this resistance process. And here, um, we only look at the, the green line. You see the ideal development there. It, the innovation emerges, then it, it's clear which innovation really brings us forward. And then we have the acceleration phase, the stabilization, everything is fine. Now that is not that it happens, but um, uh, what we look at here is what happens. What can happen is that you have the acceleration phase, and then you're faced with a backlash or with a change of government or some other catastrophe, and then uh, acceleration stops, and it and the there is not the dynamics of change are interrupted, and, um, and you return maybe to an, an incremental path, that is the this other low line where you say, okay, let's transform, but let's do it step by step and let's be very careful and so that we don't have resistance. And that means you also don't reach the, the acceleration, the diffusion, the change. You remain at this parallel structure. And, um, or you have, uh, that is the lowest line there. You maintain the old unsustainable system. You are not, strong enough to introduce the, the innovation, the change, and then you have a system breakdown. You need to be aware of that because you want to have the change because the old way of doing things is not sustainable. Yeah. And so not acting or acting too, not decisively has a, has a cost, a societal cost, but certainly also a, a, a private, um, a cost. Yeah, I will skip this because it's the text is different, um, but the picture is maybe clearer even than than it was um, um, before. And um, what um, this picture wants to show is that it's not enough to have a consciousness, like scientific uh, insights on what transformation means and, uh, and maybe have progressive movements which say, yes, we understand um, where we have to go, we have to be ambitious, but you actually need, you have the 
the obligation uh, you signed, well, you didn't sign formally the, the 2030 agenda, but uh, um, the, the international community um, uh, agreed on it. And what I find uh, uh, stunning is that it still keeps it up. We have an international community with it, which is very divided, where there's a lot of conflict ongoing, where we see the multilateral system changing. We don't know what the result of it will be, but um, the, the commitment to the 2030 agenda as a shared understanding of what a desirable future should be is still there. And I think this is something we need to protect. I was often, my colleagues often said, ah, you and sustainable development, this is just a word. This is not leading us anywhere. And I said, I know it's often used for window dressing and for greenwashing, um, but in this conflictive situation where we are in to have a shared understanding and agreed framework for how to imagine a desirable future, I think is very valuable. And that's why I cling to it. But this, that's why I talk about an obligation uh, to act. But what you also need is, you need to really understand this need to establish cooperation uh, relations across sectors of society and between government at all levels and society. It is, you can see that very clearly how it works at urban, at local level. There are many cities who have designed their own 2030 agendas. Um, there are global networks of cities of different sizes. And um, it's, I think that's more vibrant than cooperation across uh, at, at national level. Um, but this is what we try to, um, to illustrate with, with these slides. This is a very important um, message. And I think I come to the last one. That's our call to action. The call to action was not closest to the heart of my fellow scientists, I must say. <laughs> we had a lot of debate on what should we put in the call of, sign, of, of, of action. And one very stark position was we have, follow, we have concentrated on the transformation process. We cannot make substantial recommendations. And the other part of the group said yet, but if we do not make substantial recommendations, not read it because process related recommendations are always a bit dull. So we, in the end, we decided, yes, we go for phasing out fossil fuels. We go phasing out, not down. We go for um, doing something on debt restructuring and debt relief because so many countries are in a very, are facing very high debt because they had to go to uh, um, financial markets for, uh, um, um, smoothing the, the, the social and economic effects of the COVID crisis. Um, and if they, uh, many of them are extremely indebted, are at risk of default. And so they have no fiscal space for thinking about um, uh, public incentives or policies for transformation. So that is an important uh, part of it. Um, but the main recommendations which are summarized here on this page are we asked, um, member states to uh, design, to agree on an SDG transformation framework for accelerated action and which as central element includes national plans of action to be presented at the next high level political forum <coughs> in July next year, where they present action, uh, especially in those SDGs where they lag behind most, yeah? If you like, I can give you some examples for the German case. Um, but um, in many developing countries, that means they need to have a plan of action for all SDGs because they are lagging extremely behind in all of them. But uh, the important thing here is that um, if uh, better resource countries um, engage in implementation, they will represent learning examples which can also help other countries in, in uh, joining that. But what we also said is that we need um, uh, part of this plan of action should be international and cooperation and support for other countries so that they can engage in their own transformation processes. Um, we say roadmaps are needed for enterprises and for uh, local governments. And um, the second point we made is learn to transform. Yeah, so, uh, and learn means in this case, do not only focus on policy successes, but analyze when you do not success. 
learn from your failures so that you do not repeat them. Um, and that is uh, something which, um, where you can, where it also, um, uh, uh, these policy learning um, experiences are also the benefit from multi-stakeholder um, alliances so that it's not only public government, well, government looking at it or public administration, but engaging in, in, in with those actors that are interested in the change or are invested um, in the change. Use the, we of course, we think that transformation will benefit from using our transformation model. And uh, we, and the last two points are, um, we specifically looked at countries in conflict, how they, UNDP helped with that. We looked at Yemen, for example, and in the, uh, so um, UNDP modeled uh, that case. And you can see the longer the conflict goes on, the farther these countries move away, even from the baseline. So the more impossible it is to, to reach positive change. And I think that this is an, a very urgent call for the international community to invest more in preventing conflict, but if it's there to invest more in solving it, and not all conflicts are as complicated as the one we're facing in the Middle East or the one we're facing in between Russia and Ukraine. So that is uh, very important. And lastly, cooperate, you work with science. That was our call um, in the sense of um, investing um, in, uh, in practice-oriented research. There is very little research actually funded focused on SDG implementation. These scenarios, people did that with own means, actually. That's why there is relatively little research which is explicitly focusing on what does it need to implement the SDGs. So in a way, we are a bit in the dark still, yeah? Um, and on the other hand, what is very important is the goals have different meanings for different contexts. And in the same way, the solutions, the transformation pathways also need to be adjusted to the specific contexts of countries. It's like in renewable energies, you can, renewable energies require a very good knowledge of the radiation, solar radiation in countries, of the wind speeds, where does the wind happen, of geothermal conditions and so on. So it's not like in fossil fuels where you can put a coal plant wherever you are, the same coal plant. And in the same way, this deep process of societal change, which goes along obviously with transformation also is needs context specific approaches. And that means that we need context specific knowledge. And at the same time, we know that seven, around 60% or 70% of, of people live in countries with very weak systems of knowledge and research. So that's why we say that uh, um, supporting the strengthening of these science systems or science and development systems, research and development systems is very crucial also for achieving transformation. And this type of cooperation we're talking about is different from cooperating with the best universities or research institutes in China, Japan, or Brazil for making our own society and economy more competitive. Yeah, so this type of cooperation, like the agenda, is focused on the common good. Yeah, and not only on the common good as defined by national societies, but on the global common good as well. So this is so this shows that this is the transformation process we're talking about is not only ambitious in terms of funding, in terms of creative policy design, in terms, terms of perseverance and strategizing, but also in terms of, of um, the ethical dimension uh, it has. Yeah. I finish here. Thank you very much. Bit of an echo. Um, thank you very much for a very insightful lecture. I'm going to pick it up with a few questions, and then the audience will also have the occasion uh, to ask a few questions. Um, one of the things that struck me is that you're being very clear that we have to acknowledge that the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are not on track. Mm -hmm. At the same time, some people might say we also need some optimism and a positive mm -hmm. narrative to kind of not be just in despair. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you feel about that? And how can we craft positive narratives while acknowledging mm -hmm. that a lot needs to be done? 
Yeah, I know. I mean, who wants to adhere to a losing agenda, right? I mean, that is the, the feeling. Um, and what I usually say, I use the term desirable future. Yeah, and I think that is extremely important. Um, if we lose um, the, the image of, of a promising future, then we are in a nihilistic uh, play, space, actually. Mm. So the possibility to imagine a future that I want, that I am shaping to, so I'm not um, a victim which cannot do anything, so I have agency, um, I think that is important, and that is what the 2030 agenda also represents, right? Um, and the other thing is that the problem areas which are described in the goals as something to be overcome, they don't go away mm. just by ignoring the agenda. So you will have to face them anyway. For sure. Yeah, so that should be a motivation. Definitely. And you just mentioned uh, agency. When we think about agency for the people here in the room, we're at a business school and you mentioned that kind of one of the levers you uh, added with this new uh, your development report this year was capacity building. What role would you say can uh, a business school have in uh, capacity building, but also in the other levers for transformation and kind of making those more effective? Yeah. Um, now, when, when I got your invitation, I was thrilled. I thought, yes, <laughs> this, is, uh, this is very good because usually uh, persons who study this career, they want to do something. Yeah, so let's go for it. Yes, and I think um, that um, enterprises are often seen as part of on the wrong side of history in the sense of it's, it focuses on, on the destructive effects. Um, they have, and in many cases, this is true. If you think of extractive industries, for example, um, or when you think of, of industries which focus on, on, on consumption of things you actually don't need. It's just a matter of, yeah, it's something which, which you buy because it doesn't cost much, like these decoration objects. Mm. Um, so, but I think that many enterprises want to pursue objectives which um, can be subscribed uh, because they also produce social, societal goods, not mm -hmm. only economic goods or financial goods. And um, it's often also a requirement of, of um, young people who are entering the labor market to say, I, this was what I will do, what I will contribute to needs to um, be defendable actually. Mm -hmm. Um, and not just earn my life. And in that sense, I think um, it, is, it is, so to, to convey this um, understanding that being an entrepreneur is, is being a part, in the best case, being a part of this transformation process. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, very practically, capacity building is, this is a place where you can teach that, where you can, um, well, I think probably you, you have teachings like, what do I do when I have a problem? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the first thing for me would be, how do I define this problem? When do I recognize a problem? Yeah, because I think in, in um, problems are only this, uh, like, like when did it start to become a problem, to be a problem, to produce waste? or to use um, uh, toxic inputs, yeah? So to recognize your problems, what is the framework which makes you see a problem? And then what is the framework for designing what you recognize as a useful solutions? So what is, the, what is actually the effect you want to have with your enterprise? Is it a financial effect? Is it a... Um, and the effect of having, of creating jobs, or what are the, the positive benefits you want to achieve with it? So I think there is ample space for um, using the, the 2030 agenda and um, hopefully also for using our report. Very good. One last question from my side before I'll open it up to the audience. 
Um, you mentioned uh, the curricula we have here at business schools, and I think one of the things we uh, teach quite a lot is about innovation, and you mentioned that you have an innovation framework uh, in your report. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think what struck me is when I read the report, it's not only about technological innovation. You say mm -hmm. we also need societal innovation, we need organizational innovation, we need institutional innovation. Could you give us some examples of how different types of innovation come, can come together to kind of achieve a positive outcome? Mm -hmm. um, I think one very common um, example, which we also use a lot here in Germany, is to, to change the thinking from transport to mobility, yeah? And if you say um, it's so for a car factory, then it would not, we don't sell cars, we sell the possibility to move from A to B. So this would be, this is a different, it's a, um, a change of mind, but then it goes, you can go a step further. You can say what type of mobility are needed by which persons? Yeah, so then you will have a, the social dimension also to it. And then um, the institutional, so you have a technological change because then you say, okay, maybe it's not an individual car, but it's collective transport. Um, when you say who needs what type of mobility, you would analyze the daily routines of people. And then you could say, okay, what type of, how should this collective transport then be organized? But you could also say, maybe it goes, you can go a step further. Maybe this has an effect also in changing patterns of urban planning, of urban infrastructure. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so in this sense, I would, I would argue. And then if you really think about integrating these different aspects, you would also have to, that, that maybe would with the institutional dimension, you would have to change the way. Um, different uh, sectors of urban administration actually cooperate together. And then not only within the public administration, but as I, I repeat myself, um, with um, citizens, with uh, enterprises and so on. Mm -hmm. yeah. So a strong call for overcoming silos also between Absolutely. different sectors of society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Do we have questions from the audience at this stage already? Yes, you have a mic, please. Okay, uh, Dr. Schulz, thank you very much for the information you gave us. Um, there is a question came to my mind. Um, you were saying that there is a need for acceleration uh, in terms of achieving the goals. And I think it's a debate here in Germany, uh, but for leading these initiatives, you need to be here at the world stage. Uh, and if Germany lose its economic and industrial superiority due to compromising too much of what you already have, uh, no one would listen to you. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a balance to that? Mm. So I'm not the economic minister. <laughs> he has an answer to that question, um, obviously. Um, but I think it is, it is um, if you refer to the, 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 the current German uh, situation, it is uh, not an easy, easy one. From uh, the perspective of transformation, you would say, Mm. design your instruments for economic uh, policy, your economic policy instruments in a way that they support transformation so that they invest into the future. Um, and at the same time, it is clear that in, in this case now we have, it's especially large companies which have a lot of, um, of jobs. Uh, and tax income um, uh, who are at stake here. And uh, so I'm not in the position for saying what the right solution is for this now, but looking backwards, I think it also shows that um, uh, there should have been a more comprehensive view on what the potential risks are of, a, of a, an economy in which we have such a great dependence on energy intensive pr uh, production and where does the energy come from? Yeah, so I think, I mean, we have discussed that also a lot, but I think you need uh, a framework for having a good risk analysis. And what we have learned in the last five years is that never underestimate a black swan, no? mm -hmm. like a pandemic or, or a war which breaks out. So, um, 
And the other thing, just now, now going back to the German example, is that what we, what our strength was in the financial crisis now is our weakness. So um, I think what it also teaches us is don't be so confident in the structures which helps you help you in one situation. So to have more nimble, more flexible uh, economic health structure would probably be better. Just press the button. Um, Ralph Lang, thank you very much for the, the comprehensive uh, insights and, and especially for the recommendations. Uh, I, I'm talking a little bit from, a, or I'm thinking a little bit from a change management practitioner on an organizational level. So I'm pretty familiar with how does change management work and, and all these thinking around it. it, it and, and you reminded me very much from your vocabulary uh, to, the, to the most praised guru of change management, which is a Harvard professor called John Carter. And he's talking a lot about since create a sense of urgency, um, develop a future vision for a desirable future, mm -hmm. uh, get your coalition around things, get the barriers out of your way, et cetera. This is, this is the most famous and most practiced uh, um, change management model uh, in the last 50 years. The book is six, is, yeah, it's pretty old. Um, the thing is, Mr. Carter, three years ago say, uh, said this approach never worked uh, and, and it definitely never worked yeah? mm. so you're 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 jumping on a change methodology which was published in a book and translated into 150 languages mm. which mm -hmm. from the author mm -hmm. uh, is that is viewed as okay unfortunately I, I forgot about some things and it never worked so mm. he moved a little bit into with another book into the thinking where he is not concentrating on a sense of urgency, threatening everybody and paralyzing everybody with, if we don't do something, we will die. We will go mm -hmm. from the market. He, he went into creating a sense of enthusiasm, mm -hmm. uh, which I also think is the probably better pathway for, at least for organizations mm -hmm. to, built on, as you said, uh, capabilities and capacities you would have and then deliberate these mm -hmm. and forget about uh, getting barriers out of your way because this is a lot of resistance. Just, just try to get things moving. I, mm -hmm. I, I wonder what your, what, what, what do you say, uh, what, A, what you think about it and B, wouldn't it be worth to look at some of these transformational models mm -hmm. who at least not focus only on an individual level, which doesn't mm -hmm. help, but on a system level. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And there's a lot of uh, research in, done in this uh, building organizational capabilities, capabilities to change, to innovate, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. maybe that would be helpful. I mean, that would be great for the next group. To, to continue doing that because I mean we um, um, we were thrown into that exercise by the UN they decided who would be in that group right and uh, then you in the end you never know okay how is it actually really going to work out and it was clear to us that there was a lot of, of expertise we were missing in our group right and um, also, especially in the economic area, because our, our own real economist was uh, Sergei from Russia and he, he couldn't uh, really cooperate very much. Um, although he is very committed uh, to, to green transformation. So, um, um, so you might say, I mean, at some stage we also thought this is quite idealistic what we are saying here. And so I often think it is probably talking, what we say is talking best to, to those who actually are committed to transformation. Yeah, which is not too bad because um, what I learned from you is that maybe we have the wrong, uh, we, we didn't read that book, right? So um, uh, maybe I, I don't think we quoted. Um, but we, 
it must be so successful that it is sort of permeating in everyone's uh, mind. Um, uh, but what what did speak to all of us was actually was the picture of resistance, because that is the the reality you face. I mean, I have been on the German Council for Sustainable Development for nine years, and we have I have interacted with three governments, I think, and um, yeah, resistance was part of the story a, a lot, yeah. And uh, so, so I think that is why we try to make a combination of what motivates us. And that is, it is I think it is a convincing thing to, to have a, an idea of what a desirable future is. Otherwise you won't have enthusiasm, right? But um, it's not sufficient to be enthusiastic about something if you do not have a more realistic approach to what the obstacles could be and what and an understanding of, do I have the tools for, meeting that or do I need to design other tools? And so that would be my handmade answer to your elaborate question. And there's one more question here. Thank you. Uh, so my question is on a level of microeconomics. Um, what working tools, what approaches uh, do you have? Uh, do you see feasible to enforce the company mm. for the transformation, for instance, account changing the accounting systems, etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm not a microeconomist, right? So um, what um, you know that there is, I, as far as I understand, there is the possibility to go with uh, economic incentives, which have many shapes. Yeah or a regulation. And probably you need to combine the two uh, because regulation you usually use when it is really about uh, avoiding danger, preventing danger, so toxic substances and so on. Um, and, um, but also um, regulation in the sense of saying, this is the way to go to, from the, the broad, um, gamut of opportunities you would have to reach a goal, say these are the ones which won't work because they are more destructive than the risks they entail are too, too broad. Also, also because often the problem is that the, the negative effects appear much later. Yeah, If you think about um, uh, chemical substances, long lasting, persistent um, pollutants and so on. Yeah. So I think that um, we cannot rely on, on, uh, on sheer voluntary action at, at the enterprise level, for example. Yeah, so there has to be a clear signal of what, of, of what is, um, where you can go and where, where not. And that is, um, uh, and I think that's what we also, this combination is important. That's why we say it's the combination of governance, of economic and fiscal policy or financial market regulation and, um, and science probably that would be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. I saw one more hand up there. You have a mic in front of you. I try. Um, yeah, my question would be how this radical transformation that we actually need and by like keeping in this maybe step-by-step mm -hmm. -step model, we will need even more year by year that we approach year 2030 or 2050 mm -hmm. goes along with our democracy models and the way we have political decision-making because mm -hmm. I mean, a company may decide on a radical change because there's a group of people above that says now we're going to do it and no matter what it costs we're going to do it that's not how we operate our societies mm -hmm. what is your idea how we actually get to that radical transformation if we have a, a democracy model that mm -hmm. kind of prevents us to do that yeah i think that's exactly one of the important debates we're having now and there is um it's difficult to have a the one answer to to that because i think that is what policymakers in societies are experimenting with 
and experimenting with in a situation where the future is sort of closing is quite risky, but um, probably that is the only way to go. And what, that's why we emphasize um, the, the learning part so that, uh, and that which requires actually to look at what other countries have done and not only look at your own country that so and I think that is something which is quite usual to to dismiss uh, experiences with successful change which have been made elsewhere because we don't focus on that so uh, peer learning uh, also between uh, countries or to use the OECD for that or the other clubs you do belong to the G20 um, when um, in my, my former institute organized the, the, the T20 in 2017 when the Germans had the presidency of the G20. And we, we argued a lot in favor of these peer learning uh, processes. Uh, but as I said, learning is sort of, some, it seems as if it's something you do when you're young and then you don't need to learn anymore. And I think the world is changing so much and so rapidly that learning should be a constant, constantly sub supported. Uh, attitude. Now, um, the relationship between or an, an, an action, the relationship between democracy and, um, and change. Um, I, what I, I was impressed by the recent publication of uh, Stefan Mao, probably you have also read about that, where he, uh, they made uh, group interviews where they wanted to understand the deeper attitudes of people to central um, political and social questions. And the interesting thing was that there was, a, in, in, in this German society, there's a broad agreement on, which is quite progressive actually, um, in societal terms, but also in, in environmental and economic terms. But uh, the way the policy process and the political competition is working at the moment is more um, uh, leading people away from that so that they do not focus on what they actually share in terms of objectives and visions of a desirable society, but in what separates and polarizes them. Yeah. And I say that because I think this analysis of Stefan Mao reflects the strong investment which our country, our society has had in, in understanding how a better life what a better life requires in terms of tolerance, in terms of plurality, in terms of um, um, acknowledging that our life depends completely on natural systems to work and be healthy. But um, these advances are not automatically connected with advances in, um, in better uh, operating our um, democratic system and the electoral system and better understanding how to organize political competition in a constructive way. And this is really concerning, but um, what I think we also, that's why I said we also should look at other societies and countries is that um, uh, you should look for the, the surprising examples also. Where do you find examples where change is happening without being ideal in all the other aspects of a society or a polity would need. So um, if you take um, the, 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 the African Climate Summit organized by Kenya, Kenya by far is not the ideal place to be, but it is the most progressive in terms of, renew of introducing renewable energies on the African continent. So um, you do not, I think it's better in our thinking not to expect that we are perfect in all areas for being able to transform in specific areas. So, yeah, we have to work with the non-ideal situations we have. And I just think that compared to a COVID situation where we actually had to react really fast and really strong, you saw a lot of different political parties working together on a not ideal mm -hmm. way mm -hmm. to implement that in a society because also nobody knew what to do. But mm -hmm. I think maybe we don't have the sense of urgency yet mm -hmm. to have that collaboration because in theory, the, yeah. the thing is around the corner, no? But mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so that is why you need a societal um, debate about it. I think it is uh, um, probably would be also interesting to have communication or media analysis on, on that, the interaction analysis on, on that. Maybe one more question from my side, because you mentioned quite a lot of international institutions in addition to the United Nations, you spoke about the G20 and so on. Um, given that the state of the United Nations development goals is very different from country to country, and of course, uh, some countries are much more affected in terms of what they still need to do to achieve the SDGs. What role can Germany have like in the geopolitical landscape to make the case that we need kind of uh, to all move towards one direction? Well, first of all, I think uh, Germany has a responsibility in the EU. Uh, the, the European Union is, um, is absolutely central for us. So to ensure that the EU um, continues to, to um, move into the transformative direction as embodied in the European Green Deal, for example. Uh, but at the same time to, um, so I, I, because you ask what Germany should do, I think Germany should see itself as part of Europe and try to push forward collective action at European level for change. Um, but also in its bilateral activities, we, we have now all these climate and energy partnerships and, and whatnot. Um, to use those um, partnerships, which, which are being constructed in, with African countries like Senegal, for example, or Kenya, I think is also on it, uh, to use them and put them explicitly in the framework of, of SDG uh, transformation. I'm, I'm not the person who says that SDGs will be achieved if everyone knows by heart what is SDG 5 or what is SDG 8. I think that's not the type of campaign I would run. Mm -hmm. But um, what we need is, 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 a remem is remembering that and being agreed on what the central policy fields and types of change we need to achieve. And um, and that is something, so the spirit of we are engaging in partnerships because we have um, uh, shared mutual interests, the cooperation is beneficial for both, but we also contribute to this, what I call the, the global common good, that is important. Uh, so, and that is a different type of, it's a partnership plus, I would say, yeah. Excellent. Very good. Um, I think it's already past seven. So I would invite you to kind of maybe if you have some time to uh, discuss more with our audience, we have some drinks outside or for those who want to discuss. And I thank you very, very much for sharing your insights. And I think you gave us lots to think about. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.